All right, this week we're covering chapter 10. <clears throat> this is early childhood psychosocial development. What will you learn in this chapter? Why do two-year-olds have more sudden tempers, tears, and terrors than six-year-olds? What do children learn from playing with each other? And what happens if parents let their children do whatever they want? First, we're going to cover emotional development. And this involves emotional regulation. This is emotional control. <clears throat> it also involves the self-concept. Executive function, which emphasizes cognition. Effortful control emphasizes temperament, and both undergird the ability to express emotions appropriately. Effortful control, executive function, and emotional regulation are similar constructs with much overlap. Continuing with emotional development, <clears throat> there is initiative versus guilt. This is Erickson's third psychosocial crisis. Children undertake new skills and activities and feel guilty when they do not succeed at them during this stage. There's also protective optimism. <clears throat> this consists of positivity bias that helps a young child try new things. It begins around age three. It is a belief about the child's self-worth and is tied to parental confirmation. There's also pride and prejudice. A young U.S. child will pride gender, size, age, and heritage. Early prejudice involves usually nationality and religion superiority, and they typically mirror adult prejudices. Usually, North American parents encourage enthusiasm, effort, and pride in their two- to six-year-olds, and also prevent guilt from becoming self-hatred. If instead parents ignore rather than guide emotions, a child may not learn emotional regulation. All of this involves the maturing of the brain, such as neurological advances. The growth of the prefrontal cortex happens around four or five, not the growth of the whole thing, but it starts to form itself. And the myelination, myelination of the limbic system occurs. There are improved behaviors and abilities. There's a longer attention span. Brain plasticity is high at this time. There's an improved capacity for self-control. There is social awareness and self-concept. Both of those become stronger. Early emotional regulation predicts later academic achievement and success. Adults and children engage in dynamic regulation and deregulation. Children will share in their parents' emotions and vice versa. <clears throat> Continuing with emotional development, in terms of motivation, there is intrinsic and extrinsic. Intrinsic motivation is a drive or reason to pursue a goal. It comes from inside a person. It is seen when children invent imaginary friends. Extr extrinsic motivation is a drive or reason to pursue a goal and arises from the need to have achievements rewarded from outside. What do you think? Some educators want children to play less in order to focus on reading and math. Others predict emotional and academic problems for children who rarely play. My opinion is a balanced amount of play versus education. It's okay to disagree. All right, and talking about how children play, play is universal and the most productive and enjoyable activity that children undertake. There are two general kinds of play, pretend play and social play. The increasingly complex social play is due to brain maturation coupled with many hours of social play, <clears throat> and form of play changes with age and culture. Playmates are people of about the same age and social status. They provide practice in emotional regulation, empathy, and social understanding. 
and our preferred play partners over parents. All right, discussing <clears throat> types of play in terms of a scientist named Barton here. There is solitary play. This is when a child plays alone, unaware of any other children playing nearby. There is onlooker play. This is when a child watches other children play. There is parallel play. This is when children play with similar toys in similar ways, but not together. There is also associative play. Children interact observing each other and sharing material, but their play is not yet mutual and reciprocal. And lastly, cooperative play. Children play together, creating and elaborating a joint activity or taking turns. Parton described play as intrinsic, with children gradually advancing from age 1 to 6 from solitary to cooperative play. Today, there is more age variation with fewer children and more intense parent investment. <clears throat> How is play subverted today? There is a current push towards early mastery of academic skills. There is a swift and pervasive rise of electronic media. And adults who lean more toward control than freedom. All right, also continuing on with play and active play, there's rough and tumble play. It mimics aggression with no intention to harm. It contains expressions and gestures signifying that the child is just pretending. It is particularly common among young males and advances children's social understanding but increases likelihood of injury. And it may positively affect prefrontal cortex development. <clears throat> There's also sociodramatic play. Sociodramatic play enables children to <clears throat> explore and rehearse the social roles, explain ideas and persuade playmates, practice emotional regulation, and develop self-concept in, in a non-threatening context. It builds on pretending which emerges in toddlerhood. It is characterized by increasing own gender preferences as children age from two to six years. <clears throat> Boys gravitate more towards danger and violence over evil, whereas girls play trends more to domestic scenes as adults. Continuing with sociodramatic play, it advances theory of mind as children combine imagination with peers, and it varies by culture and cultural norms and it is influenced by screen time. There are AAP guidelines and the maximum of our daily adult supervised screen time for preschoolers and screen time reduces conversation, imagination, and outdoor play. All right, and moving on to learning emotional regulation. Social interaction fuels development of emotional regulation. There's empathy development and prosocial behavior, and antipathy and antisocial behavior. Prosocial and antisocial behavior are innate and universal. Antisocial behavior generally decreases with age, and social understanding increases. And prosocial behavior is extending helpfulness and kindness without any obvious benefit to oneself. This typically increases from age 3 to 6. <clears throat> Empathy is the understanding of emotions and concerns of another person, especially when they differ from one's own. Antipathy is feelings of dislike or even hatred for another person, and it may lead to antisocial behavior which is deliberately hurting another person, including people who have done no harm. How parents can differ. 
There are expressions of warmth. Some parents are warm and affectionate, while others are cold and critical. There are strategy, strategies for discipline. Parents vary in how they explain, criticize, persuade, and punish. There are expectations for maturity. Parents vary in expectations for responsibility and self-control. And lastly, there is communication. Some parents listen, listen patiently and others demand silence. All right, moving on to aggression. There are general types. <clears throat> Researchers recognize four general types of aggression. The first is instrumental. This is hurtful behavior that is aimed at gaining something such as a toy, a place in line, or a turn on the swing that someone else has. There is reactive aggression. This is an impulse retaliation for a hurt, intentional or accidental, that can be verbal or physical. There is relational aggression. These are non-physical acts such as insults or social rejection aimed at harming the social connections between the victim and others. And lastly, there is bullying aggression. This is unprovoked, repeated physical or verbal attacks, especially on victims who are unlikely to defend themselves. All right, now we're going to discuss styles of caregiving in terms of this researcher named Baumrand. First is authoritarian parenting. These involve high behavioral standards, strict punishment of misconduct, and little communication. There's also permissive parenting. This is High nurturance and communication, but little discipline, guidance, or control. And there is authoritative parenting. Parents set limits and enforce rules, but are flexible and listen to their children. There is a fourth style. The fourth style is sometimes mistaken for a permissive style, but it is different. It's called neglectful or uninvolved. Parents are indifferent toward their children and unaware of what is going on in their lives. <clears throat> There's a handy little table that lays out the parenting styles in terms of warmth, discipline, expectations of maturity, communication. discuss parenting styles. Now on to the long-term effects of those styles. Children of authoritarian parents tend to become conscientious, obedient, and quiet, but not especially happy. They feel guilty or depressed and blame themselves when things do not go well. They rebel as adolescents and leave home before the age of 20, on average. Children of permissive parents tend to be unhappy and lack self-control, especially in peer relationships. They suffer from inadequate emotional regulation. They tend to be immature and lack friendships, which is a main reason for their unhappiness, and continue to live at home, still dependent in early adulthood. Children of authoritative parents tend to be successful, articulate, happy with themselves, and generous with others. They tend to be well-liked by their teachers and peers, especially in societies in which individuals' initiate, initiative is valued. And the fourth style, neglectful or uninvolved, parents tend to raise children who are immature, sad, lonely, and at risk of injury and abuse, not only in early childhood, but also lifelong. Well, it's kind of easy to conclude which is the best parenting style, and the long-term results kind of speak for themselves. Authoritative seems to be the way to go, but there are problems with the research. The original sample had little economic, ethnic, or cultural diversity. 
There's more focus was on attitudes than on daily interactions. There's no recognition that some authoritarian parents are very loving toward their children. There's no recognition that some permissive parents guide their children intensely, but with words, not rules. And children's contributions to the parent-child relationship was overlooked. There's a three-way interaction that influences outcome of any parenting style. The first is the child's temperament, the parent's personality, and social familial context. A view from science, culture, and parenting style. Culture affects caregiving style. Cultural parenting strategies need to be recognized and appreciated. Harsh and cold parenting styles are always harmful, regardless of culture. And parental affection positively influences children despite parenting styles of culture. All right, in terms of discipline, we'll start with physical punishment. Some researchers believe that physical punishment is harmless. Others do not. Physical punishment increases obedience temporarily, but it also increases the possibility of later bullying, delinquency, and abusive behavior. Physical punishment correlates with delayed theory of mind and increased aggression. Longitudinal research finds that children who are physically punished are more likely to be disobedient and to become bullies and delinquents and later abusive adults. They also learn less in school and quit before college. Is spanking okay? Well, as you might imagine, there are two positions to hold, for and against. The pro-spanking argument is correlations between spanking and host of negative outcomes may be caused by a child's misbehavior, a third variable, and methods of anti-spanking research are often flawed. The against spanking argument involves spanking may become abusive or worse, and immature cognitive processes results in children not understanding why spanking occurred in the first place. And physically punished children often suffer in a variety of ways. Current evidence suggests children should not be spanked. Do you agree or disagree? The research also finds that children who are not spanked are more likely to develop self-control. As spanking increases, so does misbehavior. The correlation between spanking and later aggression holds for children of all ethnic groups and in many nations. And yet, it is still just a correlation and it does not imply causation. There are, of course, other forms of discipline. One is psychological control. These are disciplinary techniques that involve threatening to withdraw love and support, and that relies on a child's feeling of guilt and gratitude to the parents. Psychological control correlations involve higher parent control and lower child math scores. It depresses uh, child achievement, creativity, and social acceptance, and increases relational aggression, which is damaging someone's relationships or social status. All right, continuing on with discipline. Exclusion and conversation. There is the timeout. This is a disciplinary technique in which a child is separated from other people and activities for a specified time. Perhaps you have experienced timeout. I know I have. Evaluation of effectiveness is confounded by different styles and uses of timeout. Individual children will react in individual ways. For some children, and in some cultures, sitting alone is an effective form of punishment. For others, it produces an angry child. There is also induction. This is a disciplinary technique in which parents talk to the child in an attempt to understand misbehavior. It is recommended if internalized standards of right or wrong is a goal. 
terms of technique, parents talk extensively and help the children understand why their behavior was wrong. Parents listen as children articulate their emotions and encourage children to explore alternative behavior. And conversation helps children internalize standards, but induction takes time and patience. Becoming boys and girls. In terms of sex differences, these are biological differences between males and females in terms of organs, hormones, and body shape. Gender differences are differences in the roles and behaviors that are prescribed by a culture for males and females. By age two, children know whether they are boys or girls and apply gender labels consistently. By age four, children are convinced that certain toys, such as dolls or trucks, are appropriate for one gender but not the other. By age five, increased awareness of sex and gender differences occurs. And at age eight, a belief that their biological sex is a permanent trait occurs. From age two to age eight, awareness of sex differences, preferences for same-sex playmates, and stereotypical gender activities increase. Of course, some of this stuff is changing over the past few years as it is based largely on culture. There are theories of gender development. First one we'll cover is psychoanalytical theory. And these involve the uh, stages and complexes. First is the phallic stage. This is Freud's third stage of development. Then the penis becomes the focus of concern and pleasure. There is the Oedipus complex. This is the unconscious desire of a young boy to replace his father and win his mother's exclusive love. And there's also the superego. This is the judgmental part of the personality that internalizes the moral standards of the parents. All right, continuing on, there's the Electra complex. It's kind of the opposite of the Oedipus. This is the unconscious desire of a girl to replace her mother and win her father's exclusive love. There's also identification. This is an attempt to defend one's self-concept by taking on the behaviors and attitudes of someone else. All right, moving on to the next theory of gender development, it is behaviorism. Gender differences are a product of ongoing reinforcement and punishment. It is learned through all roles, values, and morals. What is gender appropriate is rewarded more frequently than gender inappropriate behavior. If you remember, behaviorism kind of simplified everything down to what you learn from around yourself that everything is learned. Next up is cognitive theory. This offers an alternative explanation for the strong gender identity that becomes apparent at about age five. It involves gender schema. This is the child's cognitive concept or general belief about sex differences. It is based on his or her observations and experiences. And young children categorize themselves and everyone else as either male or female, and then they think and behave accordingly. There are sociocultural theories, and they stress the importance of cultural values and customs. And they propose transmission of cultural aspects from larger community and parents. And it notes the influence of norms and preferences that change as cultures change. And then there is evolutionary theory. This posits that sexual passion is a basic human drive related to essential urges to survive and reproduce. Gender-related behavior differences are dictated by genes. Which is the best? Ultimately, no consensus has been reached. 
theorists differ in their explanations and, and interpretations of gender differences. Some emphasize biological and brain differences, and others stress the impact of culture. Each of the major developmental theories strives to explain the ideas that young children express and the roles they follow. Seems to me like this is one of those situations where combining them all is more insightful than using just one. And that concludes the lecture for chapter 10.